Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and when we last left Longstreet, he and the rest of the Confederate Army of the Potomac were preparing for a movement toward Richmond. In this video, we hear about his exploits on the peninsula, fighting back against McClellan's juggernaut of an army attempting to take the Confederate capital. On March 5th, Jeb Stuart reported to Johnston that the Union Army was on the move south, so the Confederate Army commander began moving his troops along in two columns, marching down the Warrington Turnpike and the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, hoping to take advantage of the high ground south of the Rappahannock River. Johnston moved his army behind that water barrier, while the Union Army occupied Centerville. Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee got word that Union Army transports and troops were massing around the peninsula in Virginia near Fort Monroe. Lee asked Johnston and Major General Gustavus W. Smith to examine the fortifications of John B. Magruder to defend the peninsula. In the absence of those two generals, Longstreet assumed Army Command, being the senior commander. He would hold that role for five days. During those five days, Longstreet stated in his memoirs that he proposed to Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley a meeting of the two forces to assail Jackson's opponent, Nathaniel Banks. In his memoirs, he wrote that he hoped that his army could return to their position before Johnston and Smith returned. However, no evidence of that discussion exists in the records, only Longstreet's telling of the story. Jackson wrote to Longstreet on April 3rd and then two days later, but he makes no mention of such a movement and only asks for reinforcements. Maybe Jackson thought Longstreet held no authority to act without Johnston or Davis's permission and declined the offer, but we may never know. When Johnston returned, Lee wrote to Johnston to start moving his force to Richmond. The Union Army was moving up the peninsula. Longstreet and his division moved by rail car to the capital. There, Longstreet would meet with the Secretary of War, the President, Lee, Smith, and Johnston to discuss the upcoming campaign. The meeting began at 11 a.m. on April 14th and lasted until 1 a.m. on April 15th, with only an hour break for dinner. Longstreet only made one comment, that he knew McClellan to be a trained engineer, and that his movements would be careful and most likely not take place before May 1st. With that, Davis interrupted him, and his part in the conversation ended. Longstreet then traveled to the fortifications on the peninsula where his division occupied the Confederate center. Johnson would order the trenches to be abandoned after brief skirmishing and an artillery bombardment, the Confederate army using the growing darkness to shield their retreat on May 3rd. Moxley Sorrell informed Longstreet on the retreat that General Gabriel Rains, who had been experimenting with explosives, was planting artillery shells as landmines in the road to break up the approaching Federal columns. Longstreet wrote a stern note to Rains, ordering him to stop that this went beyond legitimate warfare. On the withdrawal, Johnston directed Longstreet to preserve the Army wagons from being captured. At Williamsburg, with his headquarters on the campus of the College of William and Mary, he used two of his brigades to hold off the approaching Federal troops. When it appeared to those two brigades that they were going to be overrun, a courier dashed to Longstreet's headquarters to ask for reinforcements. He sent in Cadmus Wilcox's brigade and his own former brigade now under Ambrose Powell Hill. The Confederates battled with Union forces around Fort Magruder, but Longstreet's division began to run low on ammunition. D.H. Hill's division arrived to relieve Longstreet's beleaguered troops, but it was a costly fight to protect the wagons. The army made it behind the Chickahominy River, three miles from the capital, and waited for the approaching enemy. However, an opportunity arose to land a decisive blow to the Union Army. McClellan had divided his forces. On May 28th, Johnston called together his division commanders. Smith suggested that they attack the right of the Union Army near Mechanicsville to prevent the linking up of Irvin McDowell's force approaching from Fredericksburg. However, during the discussion, a courier from Jeb Stewart arrived with information that McDowell was withdrawing, so the junction of the two Union armies would not materialize. Stonewall Jackson's defeat of Nathaniel Banks at Winchester had forced Lincoln to recall McDowell. With that information, Smith argued to attack the Union left at Seven Pines. During the arguments, Johnston walked away with Longstreet joining him. They conferred for a few moments and decided to wait to attack until Huger's division arrived from Petersburg. While they waited, D.H. Hill reconnoitered the ground towards Seven Pines and found that the Union Army had neglected to occupy a significant road to the south of that location. Johnston conferred with Longstreet about the battle plan. D.H. Hill's division would spearhead the operation, acting as the Confederate center. Longstreet's division extended Hill's left, and Benjamin Huger's division 
would occupy the right. Smith's division would be in support, and John Magruder's division would act as a reserve. They hoped to destroy the two isolated Union Corps at Seven Pines. Longstreet remained with Johnston the whole time the commanding general organized the plan, but problems arose quickly. Johnston verbally told Longstreet his orders to command the entire front, including his own division, Hills, and Huger's. It would be Longstreet's responsibility to implement the assault. He sent the other division commanders written orders. The attack was to begin at 8 a.m. on May 31st. However, Longstreet must have misunderstood the orders given to him by Johnston. When Smith's division, commanded by Brigadier General Whiting, moved to his supporting role, he found Longstreet's division entangling the road. Ultimately, instead of marching to the left of Hill's line, Longstreet formed behind Hill, dividing his brigades, sending some to the left, some to the right, and keeping some directly behind Hill. With this new change in battle formations through the mistake of Longstreet, it took the punching power away from the Confederate assault and made the Confederate battle line smaller. The battle began at 1 p.m. and the miscommunication led to poorly executed assaults. When Hill was able to coordinate his four brigades for an attack, he was able to push aside the Union soldiers, but the fight continued. Longstreet remained at his headquarters, accompanied by Jeb Stewart. When Hill asked for reinforcements, Longstreet obliged, sending in his brigades. Micah Jenkins led the South Carolinians in a grand assault capturing 200 enemy troops. This only endeared Jenkins to Longstreet more. Before the battle, Longstreet described Jenkins as the best colonel in the army, and the Battle of Seven Pines confirmed it to Longstreet. By this point, neither Longstreet nor Johnston really left their headquarters. Johnston, knowing that problems were arising in the army, didn't investigate for himself, and Longstreet remained at his headquarters, content in sending in his brigades from afar. By midday, Johnston relocated his headquarters closer to the attack, where Lee met with him. The sounds of battle alerted them to the fighting happening to the south, and Johnston dispatched Smith's division to help on the Confederate right. As the day passed into night, Johnston ventured out onto the battlefield to get a better sense of the enemy's location when a burst of rifle fire erupted from the woods. A bullet ripped into the general's right shoulder, and seconds later, an artillery shell exploded above him, sending shrapnel into his chest, breaking a few ribs. When his staff got him back to headquarters, President Davis named Smith as commander of the army momentarily. The next day, Longstreet reported to Smith, and they talked about plans for the day. The Union launched their own assault, forcing the Confederates to fight. The two sides attacked and launched their own counter-assaults for the better part of six hours, and by 1 p.m., the Battle of Seven Pines ended. The Confederacy lost over 6,000, and the Union over 5,000. In Longstreet's report, he blamed Huger for not being in position as the reason for the attack failing neglecting to mention his own misunderstandings. When Smith filed his report, he mentioned Longstreet's delays, but Johnston requested that he delete the remarks before handing them in, probably to defend himself as well as Longstreet. General Huger asked for a court of inquiry to clear his name, but neither Johnston nor Davis called for one despite Davis promising Huger that he would when the time was right. On June 1st, about noon, Robert E. Lee wrote to the headquarters of General Smith President Davis had placed him in temporary command of the army until Johnston could return.